That was, that was, a, that was a little uncool, me. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was just sitting there with a dumb look on my face because I'm here some Ford in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs>Everybody, welcome back to the Behind the Screen podcast. I'm John Algets, and joining me this week once again after a long time away from us is Owen Poole. Uh, it's good to be back. Thanks for having me again. This is a topic I'm actually quite interested in. This week, we're going to be talking about director's cuts. We're going to be touching upon why director's cuts even exist, the history of them, how the studio system kind of tries to squelch them, all that sort of stuff. Then we'll discuss, you know, like which ones have worked which ones didn't, and are director's cuts ultimately worth it? That, that is a good question. I came at this with like one idea in my mind that like, oh yeah, I love director's cuts. And then I thought about it a little longer and now I think I have slightly more nuanced to take on that. You're kind of you're kind of dancing around it a little bit? Yeah. You're, you're, you're not 100% on it? We'll see. I definitely have a very positive opinion of director's cuts, but uh, we'll, we'll be hitting that up here in a little bit, both on YouTube and on Spotify. So let's dive right into it. Now, obviously, film hasn't exactly been around very long, just as an artistic medium. We're looking at, you know, maybe 100 years. But director's cuts, despite the fact that they might feel like a more common, like more modern practice, is actually something that's been around for a very long time. Yeah. And like the old school studio system, it was pretty rare for a director to get the final cut privilege because studios exerted a lot more control over the films back in the day because they also owned the theaters back in the day. For those of you who are unaware of that term, Final Cut Privilege, basically that is exactly what it sounds like. It is the the right to approve the edit that's going to be shown in theaters. Um, it's something that is often owned by either the producers or the studio or the distributors or, you know, anybody who has money invested into the film at some point probably has some form of Final Cut Privilege. Um, the director is it is not super common for the director to have that historically one person who did get it quite a bit uh, or some walls. Yeah, he famously got the final cut privilege with Citizen Kane, which widely considered one of the best films ever. Um, having seen it, it is it, it's good. It's a good, good movie. There's, I don't know if it's the greatest of all time. I don't know if it's the goat, but it's it's a good film. And Orson Welles, very young director. He had done a lot of theater stuff. And this was his first major film, as far as I know. And he managed to get Final Cut Privilege somehow. But then, like, the film that he followed that up on, he didn't. No. Yeah. And he hated it. <laughs> Which, I mean, that's kind of kind of story of your life when you're a director. Unless you're unless you're one of those art tour directors. Uh, but, you know, director's cuts have existed throughout the entirety of the history of Hollywood. But they were never really publicly available until 1974. This is the first time that we really know of a publicly released director's cut. There might have been others before that were, as I said, times when the director had final cut privilege. But this is a situation surrounding the movie The Wild Bunch. Now, The Wild Bunch was a was a movie that was released back in the early 70s, and basically they had cut about 10 minutes out of this movie to keep it at an R rating. Um, so they must have just cut some really like foul You gotta stuff. tease the MPAA. Yeah, you, you really do. And so in 1974, they did a few showings of the director's cut, which restored those 10 minutes. And and now that version of the film is largely considered like the definitive version of The Wild Bunch. These days, as I was saying, director's cuts are far more common. You know, basically every Blu-ray that you own has the quote unquote unrated cut or whatever, which often is pretty close to the director's cut or is just straight up called the director's cut. And as we saw in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, DVDs coming into it, Blu-rays coming into it, obviously larger, larger capacity formats. We started seeing more of these alternate cuts. Yeah. And, you know, it as movies became more modernized, it's more you're more easily able to store all that information if you have, you know, you have terabytes upon terabytes of data from the film that you shot. So now it's just a lot easier to pull off a director's cut. Yeah, basically. You know, often, you know, we were talking about how Final Cut Privilege really defines who gets to approve that theatrical cut. That all comes down to studio politics. And that's something that we saw. We, we've we literally been watching this play out for the last couple of years with the Snyder Cut. Snyder Cut. I'm so, I'm, I'm actually hyped for it to come out next year. I mean, I want to watch it. I am very dubious. To, like, is it actually going to improve things? Because I thought the Justice League was really, really bad. 
I don't know if this is going to make it better, but I I'm, I want to see. But that is an example of like, you know, the studio took Zack Snyder's work, took his vision and brought in Joss Whedon and kind of muddied the way that the film was going to go to try to fit what they wanted the movie to be. Yeah, because they wanted to marvelize it, for lack of a better term. Yeah, which and they tried. I remember they had like a mandate that it had to be under two hour runtime. Yeah, something like that. They wanted it shorter. They wanted it quippier. They wanted it funnier. So why not bring in Joss Whedon, who is his whole, that's his whole shtick. You know, and since then, you know, the studio has kind of been fighting against the fans who've been calling for, you know, the chance to see what Zack Snyder had planned. And now we're going to we're going to get a chance to check that out. So for me personally, I wasn't a huge fan of everything that was going on with the DCEU with Zack Snyder kind of at the helm. But at least he had like a like an artistic direction that the Justice League theatrical cut completely undercut. Yeah, pretty much. It like the Snyder cut of the Justice League was supposed to be was supposed to be two whole movies. And that just obviously did not happen because the story got basically wrapped up by well, let's the cut studio. It, let's cut it into one two hour movie. <laughs> So, you know, we're, we're sitting here and I'm at least hoping that the Snyder Cut is going to work and is going to gonna be the film that I wanted Justice League oh, to I, be. I want it to be better. I just don't think it really will be. Well, I think that, like, there is something to be said about the fact that Zack Snyder has, he has the benefit of hindsight. That's so, true. So, like, if something didn't work in Justice League that was going to be in his cut, because now he's got time to, like, fix stuff up, he can go, oh, yeah, I totally wasn't going to do that. That was stupid. <laughs> that, that was a Whedon thing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're... We're hoping that Snyder Cut works. And the thing is, is that there have been a lot of times where director's cuts have become the definitive versions of film. Like, I'm hoping that Snyder Cut will be of Justice League. There are some times, though, also where where things didn't quite work out. But I feel like the to start things on a positive note, because we like to we like to stay upbeat here. Uh, I feel like the the best example of a director's cut that went right is definitely Blade Runner. Yeah, I mean, that's the first thing most people think of when they think of a director's cut. Yeah, I feel like you can't have this discussion without bringing up Blade Runner. And as far as I know, it is the first, or at least one of the first films for the new cut to be marketed as a quote-unquote director's cut. And that is actually a film where there's, uh, I think there's like four different quote unquote director's cuts. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there was the, you know, there's a theatrical cut and then there was the, you know, just regular vanilla director's cut. And then there was a 90s version, which was slightly different. And then the like definitive final, final cut in 2007. Yeah, it's actually called the final cut. Yeah. Um, which if you're buying Blade Runner these days. That's the one. That's the one that that's you're That's the one that's also available on most streaming platforms. Yeah, pretty much. Um, And really what that comes down to is the fact that, you know, the theatrical cut version of that movie is not good. No. I definitely understand why that movie did not perform well. well it's, a, it's a very heady science fiction film that's admittedly very slowly paced. I'm a big Blade Runner fan. I can see people watching it and being like, hey, this is kind of boring because the pacing is kind of plotting. But to me, that's just so you absorb all the atmosphere and the world building. But maybe not everyone sees it that way. The studio didn't see it that way. No. Because they needed Harrison Ford to come in and just record the worst voiceover ever to explain every little plot detail that's happening. Yeah, they they were like, hey, this this movie is like really confusing and I don't think that anyone's going to understand it. So let's get Harrison Ford in here. And meanwhile, Harrison Ford foreshadowing how he is today <laughs> decided to show up and do the most unenthusiastic voice recording I've ever heard in my life. Like it's a, uh, it's comedic at this point. Yeah. They don't advertise for killers in a newspaper. That was my profession. But the interesting thing for me about the director's cut of Blade Runner is that it doesn't really change that much. A lot of times when you think about a director's cut, they're like adding in scenes that were deleted, extending the runtime of the movie. But the runtime is virtually the same, but just taking out the voiceover and adding in the whole unicorn dream sequence just enhances everything about the movie because the plot isn't just spelled out for you to from a lazy Harrison Ford. You get to just let the visuals tell the story more for you, which is, you know, kind of the whole point of the medium. Yeah. And I mean, like this, this is a prime example of a director being reined in by a studio. And because of that, we wind up with something that doesn't work as well. On the flip side of that, we have a director's cut. Well, you would call it a director's cut that has come about because no one was reining the director in. And that would be the Star Wars special editions. Yeah, those those th those ones. Now, the original the original trilogy, the original cuts, the original trilogy, largely they were the way they were because of it was more 
technical limitations than it was any studio telling George Lucas that he should stop what he's doing. But him revisiting the original trilogy in the 90s and then again in the 2000s for the Blu-rays and everything like that, he's mucked with stuff enough that arguably you kind of were kind of there are points in those versions that almost ruin moments in the films. Well, the most famous example is, you know, the whole Han shot first thing. Yeah. Because in the theatrical cut, obviously, he shoots Greedo dead in the bar. But in the updated special edition director's cuts, whatever you want to call them, they CGI in a blaster bolt coming from Greedo and then Han shooting second. And to me, that changes his character, not to like a fundamental core degree, but that's such a good like character moment right after meeting Han Solo. And if I'm watching the movie for the first time, I think it just it just works better when he shoots first. And I feel like a weird fanboy for being yeah. angry about it. To me, honestly, that is like that. That moment definitely was like it's wrong. And that change was definitely wrong. Yeah. And then you have like Hayden Christensen being CGI'd into the end of end of return, which I don't love. No, I'm not a fan of that. I get it, but I'm not a fan of it. To me, my anger toward those versions doesn't necessarily come from the versions themselves, but how difficult it is to watch the theatrical cuts now. Yeah, you because there like there was one publicly released version on the DVDs, obviously like there's the VHSs and stuff, which actually I have the VHSs, so I had those growing up. That was how I watched like, them. Like I could totally go back to my parents' place and watch them. But there was one DVD release and that was it. And now nowadays if you want to watch the non special edition versions, you have to hunt down like the despecialized edits that fans did online and try to find those and try to like, there's like weird systems to get around like copyright law to be able to allow you to watch that. You basically have to like piece those movies together yourself. Yeah. In preparation for today's podcast, I, I looked up on Amazon the price of the one DVD release that features the theatrical cuts. The theatrical cuts are very low quality. They're uh, laser disc rips, if I remember correctly. And that DVD set is two hundred dollars for the privilege of watching the cut of the movie I prefer in standard definition. I would have to pay two hundred dollars. That's to me is the real problem here. And I think that they, therein lies the problem with director's cuts. Sometimes, especially if they become the quote unquote definitive versions of movies. Like I'm thinking about like uh, the Rob Zombie Halloween movies. Listen, they're OK. That's the best that I could say about those as a, <laughs> as a Halloween fan. Those movies. OK, good luck trying to find the theatrical cut of those movies. You just can't. But. It would still be nice to be able to see, you know, just for archiving purposes, more than anything, to have the original versions of the film. But sometimes there are director's cuts where, honestly, I don't need the theatrical cut. You know, we're talking about we're talking about the Snyder Cut quite a bit throughout this episode. And before Justice League, there was Batman v Superman. Now, we've actually talked about this before because I, at this point, I basically only watched the quote unquote ultimate edition right, of yeah. BVS, which you haven't seen. I have not seen yet. it because I'm not I was not a fan of the, the theatrical cut of that movie at all. Yeah, no. And how long is the ultimate edition? Like three hours. Yeah, I just I, I should watch it at some point, but that's a commitment. It fixes a lot of the plot holes. And a lot of like the issues, especially surrounding Lois Lane's investigation, whole parts of that side plot were completely cut out and Zack Snyder put it back in for the ultimate edition. I'm just I'm kind of thinking looking at BVS and the director's cut of Watchmen, I'm kind of starting to think that Zack Snyder is just the kind of director who just needs to make really long movies for his visions to work. Yeah, yeah, he pops up a lot. There are certain directors that tend to have direct, like the director's cuts more publicized, at least, than yeah. other ones. Like Ridley Scott is another one, like with Blade Runner. Kingdom of Heaven. Kingdom of Heaven. Don't like, don't watch the theatrical cut of that movie. No. Like, just don't. Uh, you have one more example. This is one that you've talked about quite a bit, away from the podcast, of a bad director's Yeah, cut. this is my personal personal example, um, the director's cut of the abyss. Now I'm not going to say the director's cut of the abyss is like atrocious. It's fine. It just adds in some needless bits that James Cameron obviously wanted to have in there. They add some like extra cold war intrigue, which I guess kind of informs more of the soldier guy storyline who goes nuts. And it's already a long movie and it just bumps up the runtime by about 25, 30 minutes. And to me, the theatrical cut of The Abyss is just spot on. Oh, it's a fantastic movie. I remember, like, I haven't seen the director's cut, but I grew up with a the theatrical cut. And, like, James Cameron is one of my favorite directors. But The Abyss, 
is such a fantastically well-crafted movie and is such a landmark piece of sci-fi to me. Oh yeah. And there was some like visual effects techniques that were made specifically for that movie, the way that they shot it, like they built all those underwater rigs. It was just out of control and it's such a good movie. And you know, it's the director's cut's not a train wreck, but I grew up on the theatrical cut. And when you mentioned like bad director's cut, that was the first one that popped into my mind. That was the one that immediately came up to you. Yeah. Just cause I have a personal like love for that movie. Yeah. And I think that everybody has at least one, one director's cut that came up that they're, when you mentioned director's cut, there's just like, Oh, that was a bad example. Um, when we were pitching this episode, one that, uh, someone brought up was the apocalypse now, like apocalypse now redux. I haven't seen it, so I can't speak too much to it, but that's a good example of like, you know, somebody loves the original film and then this director's cut comes out and it's just like different enough that they just aren't on board. Just the idea of anyone messing with the theatrical cut of apocalypse now is just, I don't like it. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not for it. All of this discussion around director's cuts and around the Snyder cut and everything like that, when you really stop and think about it, when you really stop and break it down, it largely comes down to the idea of artistic intent versus studio politics. Yeah, it's a, a lot of the movies that we've talked about tend to be the studio kind of getting their fingers in here and making decisions based on what they think the audience wants or what they think is going to help them make money. Yeah. You know, which I mean, it makes sense. Like studios, they're a business. They need to be making money. And so they're going to be caring more about the bottom line than the artistic vision. Whereas directors, it's almost their job to care more about the artistic side of it or about making the best movie that they can. But when it really comes down to it, Owen, the thing that I want to know is which one do you do you think is is more important. Do you think that it is important to value the director's vision for a film? Or do you think that screw the director's vision? These are movies. They got to make money. Let's just do what the studio is telling us. And let's go with the studio versions. Well, I think that when it's phrased that way is easy for me. I It is a bit of a leading question. I'm very much a artistic intent is good. I want to see what they had in their minds when they tried to make this film. But to me, film is an art. So I want to see the most accurate representation of the artistic intent as possible. But big caveat, film is such a collaborative medium. Totally. To say that the director is the person who has the sole artistic intent behind a film is to me false. Yeah. Take Blade Runner, for example, we talked about that. Uh, Rudger Hauer, his famous monologue at the end of the film, when it, the, the tears and rain thing. One of my favorite moments in cinema history. That was an ad-libbed line. Yeah. And so if you have the idea that like the director's artistic vision has to be on screen, there's an argument for that being redone with the words on the page. Yeah. Obviously Ridley Scott liked it so much that he's like, we got to get this in there. But what if he didn't? And what if he's in the edit bay with the editor who editors are artists, by the way? Oh yeah, hundred percent. If you don't think they are, they are. We might be a little biased there because we ourselves are editors, um, but editors are artists. You know, they, they do say that the movie is made three times. It's made in the writing, it's made in the filming, and it's made in the editing. That, that, that's for real. So say they're in the edit bay and the editor loves the take, the tears and rain take. Loves it, loves it, loves it. But Ridley Scott's like, you know, I don't I don't love it. I would rather him do the take with the actual line that was on the, that was on the page. Might not have that line at all. To say that the director is like the sole holder of artistic intent to me is wrong. And maybe director's cut is the wrong word sometimes. Because yeah. obviously the director isn't like solely going in the edit bay by, and by his or herself going in there and making all the edits. There's people working on, on those director's cuts. There's a ton of people working on the Snyder cut right now. And I think that I think that's almost why like it might be a little bit better to do something like, for instance, with Batman v Superman, where it was called the ultimate edition. It wasn't the director's cut or the ultimate cut, even though we're like 99% sure that this is what Snyder meant. It's the ultimate version of the film. That's them saying this is what everybody thought this should be the definitive version of the film. Yeah, and like the, with Lord of the Rings, it's the extended edition. It's not like the Peter Jackson uh, director's cut. And I generally think, if I have to ask the question, director's cut's good or bad. I think direct, director's cuts, ultimate editions, extended, whatever you want to call them, I would say generally good because you have 
the option to watch either one. And I think it's great for Batman v Superman, for example. That's just such a long movie to put in theaters. And I can understand from a studio perspective, like people are not gonna wanna sit in a theater for this long to watch this movie. So we need to get it down to a more manageable runtime. But then people who want to watch a super long movie have the option to do it, to do it later on. And I think that is good. But what's not good is when you have a director's cut Ultimate Edition, whatever, but that's the only version available to watch. Yeah. There's some positives going forward because as much as we think of, you know, alternate cuts, director's cuts being kind of artistic intent versus studio meddling, now it's kind of in the studio's best interest to allow those cuts to exist because you can sell more DVDs and yeah, you can sell can, more Blu-rays. You can use them as a marketing thing, whether they're whether they come as a like special thing on the on the disc or if you you know a few years later release the directors or ultimate or whatever and get people who already bought your movie to buy it again or just generate more buzz around an old movie like Watchmen. yeah like the the ultimate edition came out several years later so i think that's a big positive i think that's an example a rare example where creators and studios can really just kind of team up like it's in both of their best interests if you're you know a director who really wants that creative control you can have your own cut and you're probably going to get it on a dvd at some point because the studio can make extra money off of it so yeah or you can be like the blu-ray release of army of darkness that i have over here that has literally four versions of the film across three discs including the theatrical cut the special edition the or the editor's cut the director's cut and the Te the, the television censored cut, which is fantastic. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. You don't, even, you don't even think about TV cuts of movies. <laughs> it's because they're not really a thing anymore. Like, but I think that, you know, to wrap this all up, I think that really when it comes to artistic intent versus studio politics, you know, director's cuts versus theatrical, I think the important thing to take away from this is really, I would say that director's cuts are worth it for no other reason than they're, they are an outlet for artistic intent. So whether or not you like the director's cut of a film, you think it's better or worse, I think that they are worth viewing for the sake of seeing what was intended. You know, whether or not that winds up being the definitive edition, I'll leave that up to you. Yeah, I mean, you say you really love that theatrical cut of Blade Runner for some reason. That can be your, like, personal definitive edition of the film. And I think one really cool thing about director's cuts or just any different cut of a movie is to show how different things can land with just small changes. Anyways, you know, director's cuts, as I said, worth it, if nothing else, for the artistic vision that they provide us. And also, you know, it's just more movies for us to watch, which I think that everybody can get behind more movies. With all that being said, Owen, where can people find you on the internet? Um, just search my name on YouTube, Owen Scott Pool, and you should find a video or two. Yeah, you can also follow him on Twitter. He is at Owen Scott underscore P. And while you're over there, why not uh, jump over onto my Twitter? I'm at Bender Waffles, B-E-N-D-E-R-W-A-F-F-L-E-S. Uh, get over there for my hot takes about stuff like how I think that Quake 2 is better than Quake 1. And if you disagree with me, you can fight me. Uh, please don't. Verbally? <laughs> yeah, verbally, not physically. Do you recognize that smell? Fear. Well, that's it. What do you guys think of director's cuts? Are they worth checking out or do you just pass on them most of the time? Be sure to let me know down in the comments below. And while you're down there, why not consider subscribing to Screen Rant or following us on Spotify for more awesome podcasts just like this. Thanks for listening and stay safe out there.